we're going to look at the speed of light and some of the interesting things that special relativity says happens to time when we get close to the speed of light. And you might be surprised at some of the very elementary mathematics that we're going to use to describe this phenomenon. First, let's talk about something moving at a speed much lower than the speed of light. Okay. We have Alice here. And uh, Alice is on a train car and the train car is moving at a hundred kilometers per hour. Now when we talk about Alice moving we have to say what she's moving with respect to and she's moving with respect to the ground uh, this is all on earth and here's Bob and Bob is watching Alice do her thing and he sees her moving at a hundred kilometers per hour and Alice decides to do some physics experiments and she asks Bob to take notes so Alice throws a ball and I have no idea how fast balls get thrown so I'm just going to say 15 kilometers per hour and you can laugh at me now the question is how fast is the ball going according to Bob well there is Alice in the train moving at a hundred kilometers an hour and then the ball is moving at 15 and as you probably guessed we're gonna add these and get a hundred and fifteen kilometers an hour so that's how fast the ball is going we just add these two velocities they're going in the same direction now Alice says I want to do another experiment Alice says I want to measure the speed of light so she fires a laser and she measures the speed of light very accurately it's exactly what we see in the textbooks uh, about 300 million meters per second and Alice goes, oh, that's just what I expected. And she calls that speed C. That's the standard representation of the speed of light. Now we ask the question. Bob, he, is all, he also wants to measure the speed of light, but he doesn't have a laser, so he says, I'm just going to use Alice's laser. I'll measure it while she does. And so what, what do we expect? Well, there's C there's a hundred and so we might expect C plus 100 to be the speed that Bob measures Alice's laser to be going at now it's all very logical and it's all very wrong we don't add the velocities in this case in fact what happens is Bob will measure the speed of light from Alice's laser to be exactly the same as the speed of light that Alice measures from her laser. There is no addition of velocities. So how come this is not correct, but it's okay to add the ball and the train? Okay, what gives? Well, it turns out that this state of affairs is not a property of light per se, but it has to do with velocities and how velocities add. And where it comes down to adding the ball in the train speed to get the combined speed, this is only an approximation. It's actually a little bit less than just the sum of these two velocities. But that discrepancy becomes unavoidable 
when we're dealing with speeds close to the speed of light. So we're going to do that next. Again, we have Alice and Bob. And this time, Alice is going quite a bit faster. So we're going to say that she's going at three-fifths the speed of light. She's just moving. Okay. And we've equipped both Alice and Bob with the same kind of clock. And here's how this clock works. There's a little light, there's a light source, a laser source, and it shoots light up to the top of the clock, and then it bounces back down. Okay. And every time it does that, we'll say it's one second, uh, which is a ridiculous amount of time because this would have to be a long distance for this to be one second. But we're just going to be comparing. So Alice and Bob, they have this exact same clock. So Alice does the experiment while she's scooting along and she measures time you know, the same way. These clocks have been synchronized. So as far as Alice is concerned, there's nothing really interesting happening. She and Bob are getting the same results. Okay, now let's consider what is happening according to Bob. And to do this, let us just pay attention to the light that moves in one direction. So according to Bob, his light moves up here and it goes a certain distance. Now, remember, Alice is moving. So by the time, by the time Bob's light beam reaches the top of his clock, Alice has moved a little bit of distance. And so for Alice's light to reach Alice's clock, Bob will have to observe the light moving on an angle. Okay. But these two arrows are going to be the same length. Okay. But this raises a problem because for Bob, his light has reached the top of his clock but Alice's light has fallen short of the top of her clock. So as far as Bob is concerned, Alice's clock is running slow. Now, how slow is it running? That's what we're going to look at next. Let's just look at the two clocks. And at the beginning, they're superimposed over each other. Okay. And then Alice's clock moves some distance over this way. So here's Bob and here's Alice. So what's this distance? Well, let's just call it um, the speed of light times the time measured by Bob. And remember, Alice's clock, the light will also move the same distance. This is according to Bob's observation. For Alice's clock, the vertical distance will be shorter. So let's call that C times the time on Alice's clock. Now, we're going to complete this triangle drawing this line here. How long is this line? Well, the train isn't moving at the speed of light, is it? It's moving at three-fifths the speed of light. Okay, and remember, we're, we're comparing this to the time on Bob's clock. So this is three-fifths times the, the time on Bob's clock. Now, let's see how all of these relate to each other. We know from Pythagoras that the square on these two, the square on the two sides of the right triangle is equal to the square on the hypotenuse. So let's do that now. 
and we're interested in Alice's time compared to Bob's time. So let's leave Alice on her own here and we'll group these terms together. Okay, and then we can factor out this Bob element. And then let's move the speed of light squared over to the other side of the equation as well. So we're going to end up with the time that elapses on Alice's clock squared equals this grand mess. We can clean this up a little bit as well. Let's divide everything by c squared and we end up with 1 minus 9 25 over c squared. And of course, that's all Bob and that's Alice. Now, everything is squared, so let's just square root things. So, so we find that the time that elapses on Alice's clock is the same as the time on Bob's clock, but we need to multiply it by this adjustment. All right, now what is this? This was just the speed that Alice was moving. So we'll say the velocity of Alice divided squared divided by c squared. This is the square of that c. Now this shows the factor by which Alice's clock differs from Bob's clock. And this, this expression, the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, is extremely common in special relativity. So we give it a name. We call it the gamma factor. And actually, gamma is equal to the reciprocal of this. So this is the gamma factor due to Alice's velocity. That's why we've just got the sub a here. Uh, so we could say that the time adjustment for that the time on Alice's clock equals the time on Bob's clock divided by ga the gamma factor for Alice. And we'll often see just the gamma factor and understanding what gamma means.